Spoiler warning! Geeky TV is a podcast where two friends talk about slash review the latest episodes of all the shows they watch. In order to do so, they give out spoilers. If you do not want to be spoiled, do not listen. Enjoy! Okay, I blew my nose. I'm ready to go. You sound like you just took a drug of some sort. What happened? I took NyQuil. To Geeky TV, brought to you by the Vacuum and the Network. I'm, of course, your host, the Vacuuminator, and I'm, of course, joined by Callie Carey Shoka. Hello. Hello. How are you today? I'm half asleep, but I'm good. Ah, I'm all right. I, you know, it's like I always say to um, my dad. You know, I could be dead, but I'm not. So <laughs> I'm here. I- how you answered the question that wasn't even asked. But good for you! <laughs> like, how are you? I'm good, well, so am I! <laughs> oh, I'm always that way. Yeah, not really too, too much going on, unless um, you really want to know about me getting uh, more details about me getting ticked off at Google, but if you could do that, you, you know about it, so you follow me on Twitter, go ask me on Twitter. I don't really care to mention it in this podcast because this has nothing to do with Google. This is a podcast about TV shows. Yes, it is. And I'm kind of sad because there was no My Little Pony this week. Yes, they're getting ready to ready to soup too. Yeah, the season finale is um, this coming week. Well, the first part of the season finale is this week. Yay, that's, yay, that's exciting. Shall we go on to the news? Yes. The news. So, first up in the news this week, we have Toonami to return in 2013. Yeah, actually, I found this news right after we recorded for last week and was like, it would be interesting if Toonami came back. And then it's like, I'm getting on BleedingCool.com. Toonami coming back in 2014. Confirmed! Yay! Yeah. And um, it's... I think this is really interesting and really does show the power of the internet, that there can be these huge, powerful movements like there was for SOPA a few months back, you know? All, all it takes is, like, a few social network accounts dedicated to getting something to happen and a tease about it in the mainstream, and people basically stand up and go, let's do this! And I, I really think that's what the Internet is all about and sh- always should be about, not just ass clowns goofing around making a podcast like, the network is half the time, but that's besides the point. <laughs> this is um, really cool news. Um, I'm actually right now trying to get um, an interview with Steve Bloom for DETV, and if we do, I'm I'm not going to be like full on fanboy, but I'm definitely going to ask him a few questions about this whole tsunami thing, like whose idea it was and how he was contacted about it and the whole shebang kind of thing. But that's really our only news article, so um, I just noticed I'm kind of mumbling and I should should ask you what you think about this, Callie. What do you think? <laughs> I, I don't even know. I have nothing. I'm sorry, I have nothing. <laughs> My opinion is I don't have an opinion. <laughs> All right, then. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to this week's TV review. New shows. (laughs) 
Power Rangers Samurai. Power Rangers Samurai, episode 32, Runaway Spike. The Rangers battle a Mutma. The Rangers battle a Nylock that creates mirror images to confuse them, while Spike looks for a job to help out his Uncle Bulk. Um, yeah, Power Rangers Samurai is getting surprisingly good lately. Like, it just started out as just another Power Rangers series, and I didn't really care either way about it, but I kept watching for some reason, but... Lately, like, it's been having, like, these little bursts of awesomeness. Like, I've been really liking these past few episodes, and I was really liking it when, um, Antonio first showed up, so... Um, yeah. I think they really should focus more on Hulk and Spike, because, in my opinion, they really are the two most interesting characters in the entire cast. The Rangers are just land stereotypes like they were back in MMPR, but yeah, I, I just really liked this episode, and it really showed that Bulk and Spike aren't just these comic relief characters, you know, they actually do have a life, it's not just like, oh, time to get up and do something silly for the show, da 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 da, you know. I've, and it was also very interesting because there might be some sort of social commentary in the whole, you know, the economy is bad thing, thing because um, it was like they they didn't get an eviction notice, but they got a notice saying, hey, you need to pay up in X amount of days or you're going to get an eviction notice. So... I don't know, I, I really am just saying a lot of random things about this, but what it basically comes down to is I really like this, and it's an odd thing for Power Rangers to do, but I think they should do it more often. I'm going to give this episode a 9 out of 10. Young Justice Young Justice, Season 1, Episode 25, Unusual Suspects. Um... I've dis I'm not really happy with the description that Wikipedia gave, so I'm basically just going to give my own sort of weird one like I do half the time on this show, but um base this episode pretty much went all out and it's definitely leading towards the next couple episodes being sort of a season ender free to however many parts they do part. Um, and a lot of stuff got revealed in this episode, and I'm going to be talking about it, so this is your um, official spoiler warning if you don't want to know anything. If you haven't watched the episode yet, you may not want to watch this. Um, basically, um, Artemis and Megan eh, um and Connor, all three of them came out and basically revealed their secrets to the team and said, you know, we've been being bright, blackmailed by the bad guys, and um, Artemis revealed the fact that her dad and older sister are villains, and this, that, and the other thing, and it was a very interesting moment, because I really thought they were all going to get their own episodes where they revealed it, like there was going to be like this kind of heart-to-heart -heart scene with all of them, but no, instead it was like, get it out of the way quickly, let's get on to the action, which I'm sure some people liked, but for me, it kind of felt half-assed and didn't really make a lot of sense, but, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it, I'm not getting upset about it, and also they revealed the person who's basically behind this um, mole thing where the villains are all coming together to take out the Justice League is Vandal Savage and Roy, the person who was going around and being like there's a mole on the team, we have to find out who it is ah, he was actually the mole and I found that to be a really cool twist, you know, what's a twist kind of a moment and his face when he actually found out that he was the mole cracks me up every time I see it um but definitely some huge build-up for the next episode, which I'm really looking forward to. 
and I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. Yeah. Green Lantern, the animated series. Green Lantern, the animated series, season 1, episode 7, Reckoning. In an, in an attempt to murder Atrocitus, Razor goes to the Red Lantern homeworld shard. Um, I, DC Nation really was pulling out all the stops with its shows this week, and um, this was a, for Green Lantern, this was a particularly good episode of the show, like... I'm not saying that any of the episodes were bad, I'm just saying this was, like, really good, because we're finally getting back to the Red Lantern stuff that they teased in the pilots, and I'm really enjoying it, and I've never really cared about the Red Lanterns either way in the comics, but this Atrocitus, man, he's just a badass, and I'm almost kind of hoping they do make figures for this show, because... I don't really know about anyone else, but I'd at least want a Razor, because he's becoming a pretty cool character in the show, and I can no longer deny it, um, you Tumblr shipping people are right, they are hinting hardcore at a relationship between Razor and Aya, which kind of creeps me out, to be honest, because she's a robot, and he's an alien. That makes no sense. How's that gonna work? Oh, whatever. I, I found this to be a really good episode, and I hope we get more of the Red Lantern stuff in the future, because I really enjoy it for some bizarre reason. And this is from the guy who dropped Red Lanterns from his poll after the first issue, because it was bad. But I'm going to give this episode a 7 out of 10. Moving on. Last Man Standing. Last Man Standing, Season 1, Episode 21. Wherefore art thou, Mike Baxter? Um, this episode is very just okay, in my opinion. Unlike most of the show, there wasn't a lot of laugh-out-loud jokes. It was just kind of like, oh, that's funny, let's keep going. I, I didn't necessarily dislike this episode, but at the same time, I can't say it was, like, really good. It was just sort of there, and I don't know. Last Man Standing is one of those shows where it's either I'm busting my gut the whole way through, or it's just like, oh, well, at least it's cool that Tim Allen is back on TV again, and this is one of, and this is the latter, so... I don't know, I'm gonna give this episode a four, but uh, I don't really know, it's just kind of a meh episode, so let's move on to something better. The Legend of Korra The Legend of Korra, Season 1, Episodes 1 and 2, Welcome to Republic City and A Leaf in the Wind. Yes. The Legend of Korra has finally re- Oh, has- Ah, my tongue's being- Nah. But, <laughs> yeah, Korra is finally um, on the airwaves, and I cannot be happier with this show. I was really expecting to come off like, uh, I'm not really enjoying this, where's all the characters from the original show, but- it actually succeeds very well in standing on its own and being a great show. I almost think, in some respects, it's a little better than The Last Airbender. And I know there are some Avatar fans who are going to come after me and try to murder me with a stick or something because I said that. But I honestly do think that. And um, this may be a little sacrilegious, but unlike the rest of the fandom, I can't really say I miss a lot of the old characters, because I'm enjoying the new characters so much. Um, Korra, for instance, I went into this thinking she was going to be one of those characters where it's like, oh, she's a tough tomboy, and she's no nonsense, and this, that, and the other thing, to the point of where it was annoying, which, um, 
I don't want to sound offensive to the women empowerment movement, but that's really what the women empowerment movement has been lately, where it's just like, let's make these tough female characters, and I'm all for that. But they half the time, they just turn out being completely annoying characters rather than cool. But Korra dodged that bullet pretty neatly. I, I found her character to be very realistic, and there were even several moments where I went like, you know, if I was in Korra's shoes, I would have done that too. She didn't feel like this caricature. She felt like a real person. Um, and my favorite character of the show so far has to be Tenzin. He is hilarious and played by the great J.K. Simmons. Um, it if you haven't watched the show yet, you need to watch it just to see his performance as Tenzin. It's hilarious, and the animation helps out with that performance really well, too. Um, I'm also really liking the villain for this show, Amon, even though we only got him, got to see him for a few seconds. He, he comes off as a totally creepy badass, like Soundwave and TFP, and some people really don't care for Amon, but I'm all for him. I think he's an awesome villain so far, and I look forward to actually seeing him um, fighting next week, which it's been teased that he'll be in the next episode, so I'm excited for that. Um, there's a lot to go over with this, but basically, real quickly, I, I find the animation to be some of the best animation that's out there on TV right now. Um, the music is fantastic. I'm really hoping they'll release a soundtrack for this. Um, Mako and Bolin, I forgot to talk about them real quick. I found them to be interesting characters. Bolin seemed a little bit of a cocky, annoying twat. But uh, Mako seems like an interesting character, and because of um, split-second clips we've seen in previews for up-and-coming episodes, they pretty much spilled the beans of him and Korra are going to be an item. So I'm not really sure how I feel about that. I'll have to wait until it actually happens in the show instead of just seeing, instead of just being bombarded with fan art fans saying this, that, and the other thing about the show. Um, but this really is a great show. I think it's one of the best cartoons on TV right now, and if you're not watching it, you're crazy. You need to go download the first two episodes and see just how awesome it is. I'm going to give... I, I'm not going to give it a rating, because all scores are relative to their series, which is, means it's based on previous episodes. So I'm just going to say I'm giving, I'm giving this premiere a stamp of highly recommended. So go find it. Do that now. Now let's move on to the reoccurring shows. Reoccurring shows. Transformers Prime. Transformers Prime Season 2 Episode 9. Grill! Agent Fowler has some explaining to do under the threat of military tribunal and Team Prime's termination. It was a clip show. It was a freaking clip show. Flip episode with a couple of random scenes that were awesome, I admit. <laughs> it was still a clip show. Okay, I hate clip shows. I'm going to be honest with you. I hate clip shows. I think they're one of the worst things in television, and it's just lazy writing to do a clip show, in my opinion. That being said, I found this to be a kind of a fun episode, and um, I laughed so hard when Prime came up to the window and was like, Fowler, have you found mech agents? And, and the general's just like on the edge of shitting his pants because there's a giant robot at his window. That was I'm just like, hi, how are you? Uh, I'm fine. That was the entire scene, yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. And they brought up the Unicron Unicorn joke again. Uh, yeah, that's a little annoying. But I did like your tweet of the that Beast Wars character that should show up in Prime. That unicorn should show up just to screw with people. Like, now there's an actual robot unicorn. Yes, that would make me laugh so hard. But... It's not gonna happen! 
nothing but it'd be hilarious. Yeah, but I can't, to be honest, I can't really give this episode a rating of, a av- of average because it's a clip show, and I consider it's a clip four. show. Yeah, I'm. I was gonna say I was either gonna give it a three and a half or a four, and I act. And unlike most episode ratings, which most times when I give an episode a number rating, it's just sort of off the cuff. But I actually gave some hard thought about this because it's the first clip show that we've ever reviewed, and I have to be honest, I think it deserves a four. I was gonna give it a three, but it gets a four just for that bit at the end with Prime at the window. Fringe. 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 Season 4, Episode 18, The Consultant. This one is actually a really good episode because they revealed some plot points. Um, They kind of didn't solve some certain plot threads, but they did actually um reveal certain things that we weren't expecting. For the past few episodes, they were so sure that it was a shapeshifter behind everything, and that was just some guy using blackmail. Uh, granted, it was Mr. Jones, but... Um, who is like this big guy that's been causing havoc over multiple timelines for like three seasons or something. I'm probably wrong, but nonetheless. Mr. Jones was like, yeah. Um, he's been blackmailing one of the, uh, characters who's broils. He's been blackmailing the other universe's broils with his son's medication that only he has for God knows what reason. Um in order to pretty much destabilize the universes in the, with the whole attempt to destroy everything, which seems like a very poor reason to do anything, but okay. Um, so yeah, that was actually, we actually got to see how a lot of characters interact. We got a little bit more on the whole, um, the main universes, Lincoln Lee, and the other universes, Olivia, actually getting a bit of a romance going on. And I have to say, it's got to be really awkward to be at the funeral of your alternate self. He was the Lincoln... I have some advice for this Droyles guy. For the what? Stru- I have some advice for this Droyles guy. The destruction of the universe is bad for business. No, Droyles isn't a bad guy. What? Okay, what? I got you. Royals was being blackmailed because his son was sick, but only this Jones guy had the medication because he, he, I don't know exactly how the hell he's so damn smart or has multiple universe information. I think I forgot that episode or something. But yeah, so he was like, put these devices in places around and yeah. Except the Royals decided not to do it at the end and called his alternate universe self to go, help me! And got himself, he handed himself in, essentially, to the multiverse authorities, or whatever passes for that now. Um, there was a very interesting moment, actually, that had nothing to do with that plot line, about the main universe's Lincoln Lee, um, watching from the car the funeral of his alternate self, who died the episode prior. Which has got to be the most awkward thing I could think of. It's like being at your own funeral. And seeing, like, your parents crying over your grave or your alternate universe's parents crying, it's just, it's got to be the most awkward thing. And he's in a romance with the alternate universe's Olivia, who was in love with this alternate universe self, but there is the whole, it isn't creepy. It's more just like, I'd like to give this a shot. And she's just like, okay. It's nothing explicit. Neither of them has actually said they want to date the other, but the chemistry is kind of there. And I don't know why I'm talking about the romance in this episode. Um, but the entire episode was trying to see who the, they knew that there was a mole in the, in the, in their organization, and they couldn't figure out who it was. It ended up being Broyles who was being blackmailed. And the other universes of Olivia came up with this great plan to, to, to find him, which I will not reveal. You should see this episode. It's good. This is just a generally a very good episode with a lot of, with not too many things to make you confused going on, but a good enough thing to make it interesting and compelling. And it did end up leaving off with the clip, with the tiny cliffhanger, cause they didn't get Jones. Um, but they know what he's trying to do now. So, yeah. I'm giving this, I'm giving this particular episode an 8. 
Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, I don't have been, we're in season, season two, episode three, What is Dead May Never Die. Holy crap, this episode. They managed to introduce more characters into Game of Thrones. For the first time, we actually see Queen Cersei's, Queen Regent Cersei's other children, which they never mentioned or showed in the episode prior. Somehow, I was under, as someone who never read the book, I was kind of under the impression that Joffrey was her only son, but apparently not. Okay. Um, they, they introduced the Knights of Summer, I believe is what they're called. With, the, there's a king, there's like five different kings now, all people trying to say, we're the king of this place. But no, there's this, the King of Summer with the, I want to say the Flower Knight, but I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, he has this crown that kind of looks like deer antlers or trees or something. Anyway, um, um, Tyrion Lannister, the queen, the main queen sister, does this crazy, hilarious thing where he tells the three people that are closest to the queen three completely different stories. Because he knows that what the, that he wants to marry the queen's daughter off to three completely different people. Because he knows that one of them is going to tell the queen, and that and he tells this in order to figure out who the hell he should not trust. So it ends up being the one guy who no one thought would be the least likely to to be trust to be to be tr- a trusted individual. Um, when Littlefinger is more trustworthy than you are, there is a problem. Yeah, he's the the old guy that's been there for the entire couple of seasons, like this Lannister family friend. Like he's in the cell now, that's okay. Tyrion was awesome in that entire in the entire sequence. We're just like, yeah, I want to marry the queen's daughter off to this guy. No, I want to marry off to this guy. They managed to do this in this one epic scene. Um, Brienne had an awesome introduction. Let me set this stage for you. Um, completely different from Queen Cersei now. With the knights, the, they introduced pretty much knights of summer by the, the king and his queen watching a couple of, uh, a sparring match essentially between two people in full body armor knights. One of them is the, is the queen's brother. The other one, face mask, you can't see who it is. That knight kicks the queen's brother's ass. And then the, the king called like, kneel in front of me, take off your mask. It's a woman. Which is completely unheard of in a world like this where all the girls are pretty. Just what you think of as women in the Middle Ages. And Brienne is huge. In the book, supposedly, she was stated to be a large woman, but I think they added, like, stilts or something. She was, like, seven feet tall. Like, and she looks the part of someone who could be a knight. And I like that, that they put women in a role like this. I mean, they do it a lot in Game of Thrones, but this I, I particularly liked. Um... The same king and queen of the of the summer nights. I'm terrible at remembering these names. Oh my god, Game of Thrones is so confusing. Um, had the best, I want to say, sexual misadventures I've ever seen in Game of Thrones. And they had a lot of sexual misadventures in Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones had a lot of sex in it. Um, but it's HBO. HBO has a lot of sex in it. The king is apparently having an affair with the Queen's brother. Yeah. Which I'm completely not surprised by, somehow. So when the Queen comes back, started kissing her husband, and her husband's really not into it, for whatever reason, and the Queen's just like, do you want me to get my brother to to start you off? And the shock on his face was just priceless. He's like, what? And she's like, I can lie down and pretend I'm him, and you can pretend I'm him. And he, it's just this priceless scene where she's just, he's just shocked and appalled that his wife knows, and she's just completely cool with it. It Somehow I found this completely hilarious and made me like them more, which seems at odds considering everything going on. But this episode had a lot of things going on, but it's Game of Thrones, so you have to expect that a lot of things are going on. But I'm going to give this episode a nine. It's only because um, a lot of things happen. And uh, Arya Stark, what's happening with them and the king's force and the Joffrey's forces killing kids just indiscriminately. Another episode that ends in child slaughter. 
So, yes, I'm giving this particular episode a 9. It was just that good of an episode with a lot of funny things going on on top of the drama. The Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory, Season 5, Episode 21, The Hawking Excitation, which is a word we just found out what it means. That's new to us. Yay! Uh, yeah, this was an interesting episode. I'm not a really big Sheldon guy, but I found it to be quite hilarious because uh, it's basically watching Sheldon fangasm for an entire 22 minutes, which... He doesn't exactly fangasm that often, so I found it so I found that to be a very funny thing to watch. And um I'm really starting to think that Wallowitz is pure evil because oh my gosh, some of the stuff he put Sheldon for just so he could get his paper to Stephen Hawking. Wow. Um but, yeah, it was a very funny episode, and I especially liked the bit at the end where Stephen Hawking actually cameoed, and Sheldon basically just fainted the moment he started talking to him. Uh, it's, it wasn't incredibly good, but I am definitely going to give it a 6.5 out of 10, so, yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty much it for this week's episode, I would say. A lot of interesting stuff happening in TV, and uh, I got a lot of stuff to look forward to this coming week. My DVR is going to be filled to the brim with goodness to watch on Saturday, and I'm quite excited about that. How about you? Yay! Oh, jeez. Um... But, I'm sorry. I just I'm just thinking about BobCon right now. Uh yeah, that's 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 this coming week, isn't it? Not this week, next week. Uh, all right. But yeah. Anyways, thank you for watching Geeky TV. Don't forget, we are a podcast brought to you by the Vacuum and the Network. You can go to our unofficial official site, the Vacuum and the, the Vacuum and the Network to check out all our other podcasts and official video series. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. I, um, the network Twitter is at the Vacuum and the Net. I'm at Vacuuminator, and Kelly is at Kelly Carey Shoka. Um, you can subscribe to us on YouTube to see every episode of GPTV as it comes out. That's youtube.com slash user slash the vacuum and network. I'm, back, I'm the vacuuminator on YouTube, and Kali is, of course, Kali Gary Shoka. And um, that's pretty much it, unless Kali wants to go ahead and plug BotCon. I'm going to be at BotCon. I'm going to be selling things. Yay! Yes, BotCon is looking up to be very interesting this year, but I don't know. I expect it to be the strangest convention I've ever been to. Yeah, that's pretty much it for this week. We'll see you guys next week, of course. And until then, I've been the Vacuuminator, joined by Callie Karishoka, saying... Bye!